Good morning, everybody. We are on Facebook Live. We are in the Innovators Corner in the East Hall of the Von Brown Center. This is part of the AUSA Global Symposium, and we are very, very fortunate and happy to have uh, Major General Cedric T. Wentz with us this morning. Uh, he is from the Research Development and Engineering Command, RDCOM. Is that right? That's exactly right. <laughs> uh, and you're going to, we're going to talk about several things, but first of all, let's talk about this, because one of the things about this entire event is showing where the Army is and then where we might be headed, the kind of equipment and procedures and things we might have in the future. So what are we, what are we looking at right here? So what you're looking at here, uh, Steve, is the Intelligent Autonomous Systems for Man and Unmanned Teaming. It's a research effort uh, that was done uh, by our Army Research Lab, which is up in Adelphi, Maryland. And it's actually a collaborative effort that allows uh, our research scientists to begin to get after what the Army thinks it will have to do and how they'll have to operate in the future. And we think the future is uh, manned and unmanned teaming where some systems will allow uh, the soldier to not have to do the dull and dirty work and the hard and dangerous work that's out there on the modern battlefield. Okay, now I know we've got remote control uh, un unmanned ground vehicles. Uh, when, you, when you say autonomous, what, what do we mean by that? So what we mean is that in some respects, this type of capability uh, can do some of the things separate from the soldier in terms of if you're looking at something that is uh, a counter explosive, a counter hazard yeah. capability, it can disassemble or it can characterize what that threat is and provide information back to uh, the soldier to then make the decisions about what will happen next. Okay, so why did the autonomous part, so we can do the remote control, why did, does the autonomous, uh, does it make it more effective? Is that why we're, we're trying to get to take the men out of the loop or is it allow the soldier to, to concentrate on other things while this is doing its job. So I think it's both. Uh, as I said earlier, what it does is it allows the soldier, it, it uh, provides the soldier an opportunity uh, to, number one, uh, take away from the dull, dirty, and yeah. dangerous work that they would have to do. Uh, the second thing it allows is it allows the soldier to be better utilized in other areas. So the key to what we do is provide war fighting capability. And so anywhere where we can take away some of the burden of other things that the soldier would normally have to do in the current battle space, we think that the future will provide a capability where uh, they can be more focused on war fighting yeah. and less focused on certain areas where autonomy might benefit them. Yeah, and by the way, we, please ask us questions if you have them because we'd like to, well, the general would like to answer those questions, <laughs> but uh, but uh, have, you know I, I know that the army you can't plan on what you're going to do next year. You've got to plan on what you're going to be doing several years down the road. So, a semi-autonomous. How far out are we on having this kind of capability in the field? So I I would say that uh, the ability to do a semi-autonomy uh, is certainly something that's achievable in the next five to ten years. Okay. Uh, they're very similar to commercial industry. Yeah. Uh, you see a lot of uh, vehicles on the road today that essentially can operate um, absent uh, the interface or the interaction, direct interaction of a person in a vehicle. And so that technology is out there. We're working on it. We're working on it in uh, many instances uh, in collaboration with industry and academic uh, folks. Okay. Uh, and so we're talking about like driverless trucks and cars will be sure. here sometime. Sure. This will be the battlefield version of that. Sure, sure. Okay, now, this is set up to do jobs. Might something like this, I'm not saying when, but in the future be weaponized, where where you might use these for, like, security at night around a, a, a forward a forward base? Do you, do you see that in the future? Yeah, so I, I think uh, certainly you see that in the future. In fact, uh, we have some of that capability right now where um, in... Iraq and Afghanistan, we had uh, remote weapons uh, systems uh, that were uh, not directly tethered to the soldier, but were operated at a distance by soldiers. So uh, if you're thinking about an outpost, 
um, that needed to be secure to provide security around a, a forward operating base. We had that capability out there. So certainly if we're doing it now, we think that uh, the technology maturity efforts that we're working on will bring about uh, a better, more robust capability for the soldier in the future. Um, I, I'm not sure how long you've been in the Army, but you've been in the Army for a few years. Yes. When you see these things and what's coming, is that, I mean, that, that has to make you just go, wow. Yeah. yeah. I, so I, I get really, really excited. I have a 17-year-old son who's very much into technology. Uh, and so we do things a lot to go and see movies and a lot of the things that you see in movies uh, and read in books that you can imagine. Yeah. Uh, we've got a fabulous group of scientists and engineers that fall up under the Army Material Command that are working on these types of things. And so their imaginations are far reaching uh, and their expertise and their ability to take things that we consider the art of the possible yeah. Uh, and bring them to a reality. I know that uh, one of the themes for this entire event is uh, what the Army needs to fight a multi-domain battle. This would be, would fall under the cyber section of that, wouldn't it? It's, it's so, so when they talk about multi-domain, unmanned and, and semi-autonomous, and maybe someday autonomous would be part of that effort. Sure. So the, the, <clears throat> the whole, um, concept of multi-domain. Number one, it acknowledges uh, the principal role that the Army plays, certainly in the land domain, but it, it recognizes that there are many other domains that are critical uh, to providing joint combined arms maneuver. And so that recognition uh, is that as a part of the joint force, if the Army is called upon to do things in other domains, the cyber domain, as you as you mentioned, uh, then we have the capability uh, to do that. And that capability comes about through the fabulous work that gets done in the Army, with industry, with academia, with our international partners uh, to provide uh, capability in all domains. And uh, I've got to believe with that, the modern soldier coming from cell phones and iPads and, and gaming, this won't be a big deal to the, to the, to the guys coming from now on, will it? Right. It's like, it might be a big deal, certainly a big deal to me. I'm, I'm sure you're all up to date. Very, very much a big deal to me as well. <laughs> but, but, I mean, that, that is one thing. I mean, that, that is a bonus of, of the modern world, isn't it? Absolutely. So I think uh, one, so as we think about the capability that we're providing, we try to provide the capability that empowers, protects, and unburdens the soldier. Uh, and in doing so, we have to develop technology that is simple, yeah. easy to use, uh, very intuitive in the way that you use it, uh, so that the soldier uh, gets it. Very, very little instruction would certainly be a goal for the technology that we're developing, very similar to a lot of the technology that we have today, where it's, it is very, very intuitive to use. You don't require uh, hours and hours of, of study, hours and hours of practice, or going through mounds and mounds of users' manuals. And uh, as with everything the Army does, it's about saving lives, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, Absolutely. simple to use, but you have that big, big thing hanging over sure. saving lives. Sure. So we, what we, absolutely, it, across all areas, and the great thing about the Innovation Corner, uh, that anybody who comes out here and takes the time to see what we have, is not only uh, are we going to see technology that is being worked on by the engineers and scientists of my command, we're also going to see technology that is being worked on specifically for medical uh, research because the Army has a, a very, very robust set of doctors and, and scientists that provide medical capability for the Army as well. And so we're going to see some of the technology that they're yeah. working on. Uh, we have an engineering arm, uh, which is in the form of a research development center, uh, and we will see uh, some of the technology that the engineers are working on. That's, that'll, that'll be in the innovators' corner. It'll be in the, the innovation corner for the next three days, correct. Uh, Okay, so the main floor is open to people, the general public who registers. Is this area also, or is this one of the private ones that you have to pay for? This area is open to okay. the general public, and we certainly encourage anyone to come down and see what the Army's working on. 
and and join the AUSA if they could. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. That, that's absolutely. the commercial. Yes. Um, you know, it kind of blows me away, and I'm and I, I'm out at Redstone a lot, and so I see all the neat things they're working on, like. Uh, what might be the helicopter of the future or the yeah. aviation for the Army in sure. the future. Uh, it is, it is it's almost mind-boggling how much things might change in a decade. Right. Uh, do you think the average public gets that? that, that I mean, because the movie, you know, we see movies and stuff, and you're you not sure that stuff really happens, sure. and you see foot soldiers, you know, going house to house, but there are things coming that will make their job a lot easier. So I think uh, the rapid pace of change uh, in the commercial space uh, in, in the form of technology that's being introduced is somewhat reflective of the rapid change of technology in the military space as well. And the challenge for us is that uh, as we recognize the maturity and the rapid pace of change in technology, so do our potential adversaries. So what we have begun to recognize is that our adversaries are going out and buying or acquiring technology uh, that is very, very cheap to acquire, very, very easy to make. And so we have to make sure uh, that the overmatch, our ability to exceed their ability yeah. to use technology to harm us, we have to make sure uh, that we continue to have and continue to maintain an advantage in our overmatch capability. And, and there's no stopping anywhere, is there? No, no, I don't think you know, so. I mean, you I don't get to say, okay, we're there. It, no, it, I, think, I think if you can imagine it, you can think it, and if you can think it, you can probably produce it in some way, shape, or form. Uh, in the United States, it, it seems to me that we're lucky and that we have Industries constantly looking for things. There, there, there are companies in, 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 right in this community right now trying to think of, okay, what, what might they need down the future? That makes y'all's job a little bit easier, doesn't it? I, I think it does because it gives us plenty of opportunity to, co to collaborate. Uh, certainly, we do a lot of uh, work with uh, some of the larger industry partners. This uh, effort here was done in collaboration uh, with uh, General Dynamics as a partner for this research effort. Um, what we would like to do in, in going to the, that potential that you talk about is we know that there are a lot of small businesses that are working on things uh, and the creative minds out there in that space are there and the more we can partner with them uh, we can bring about some of these technologies that we think are necessary. Okay, Max, have we got any questions? We do have a question from Scott Anthony. He asks, with this new tech being brought um, in, is it still going to be civilians providing the maintenance like current robots being used by EOD and routine clearance gr groups, or are they going to pass that off to the military? That's a complicated question. It is, <laughs> it is, it is, but it, it, gets, it gets at the heart of uh, one of the things uh, that rapid technology brings about. So I think the answer to Scott's question is uh, that it goes back to that simple and easy to use and easy to maintain. So the more time we have to develop technology uh, where we can uh, make sure that we really understand the technical data associated with putting it together uh, and our ability to put it in training or maintenance manuals or training and maintenance tools, uh, then the more we can become reliant on our soldiers. And we've got a fabulous group of maintainers and sustainers in the Army uh, that we can rely upon to do these types of things. Uh, but it all goes down to simple systems, easy to use, reliable systems uh, that we can put out in the field and allow soldiers uh, to operate and maintain. So I, I, you're saying that Use the civilians if you have to, but you want the soldiers to know how to operate and maintain this equipment. Is Absolutely. That, is that uh, that's the goal. Absolutely. Okay. And and for as much equipment as we can, we can introduce to the field. I think that the challenge is uh, the rapid pace of technological change sometimes um, causes us uh, to iterate technology, introduce technology in different cycles and stages, and the maturity comes about uh, after a number of years. Well, sometimes when you're trying to create technology uh, to get it out in the field very quickly, 
uh, what you end up doing is you get the technology out there. And so in order for it to be maintained, you have, you have to be reliant. But the more we can get more mature technology out there, the more we can depend on our soldiers. Okay. Uh, one thing about technology, it's not cheap. Absolutely. So, it, it, so you're having to operate, you're doing the research and the development, and then when you feel these things, how hard is it to demonstrate a legitimate need for that piece of equipment so that you can make it can become a budget line item? Sure. Because yeah, sure. i got to believe that's a real task. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so it, it is a challenge. Um, the, the key uh, with any technology, I believe, is uh, for us, early partnerships, learning what the art of the possible is. Uh, and so one of the things that we're really trying to drive and hit home is the ability to do more experimentation, more experimental prototyping okay. uh, so that we can put a system out and allow soldiers to touch it and feel it and operate it and give us feedback immediately, right? How well does this piece yeah. of kit operate like something I'm accustomed to, yeah. right? How, so if I, if I have the the, the modern controllers that exist in a lot of our yeah. gaming systems, wouldn't it be nice to build a piece of technology that can be operated like that so that the soldier who gets it, he says, hey, above all else, I won't have to learn how to use this yeah. controller. Now, I may have to understand how it affects the operations yeah. of a piece of kit, yeah. uh, but how do I use it? So, so basically, you're saying, telling the soldiers in your spare time, please play video games. No, no, but but video games. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a very yeah. very neat uh, connection yeah. between some of the video games and some of the things that you see in the video games are, are representative of a lot of the technology that we're thinking about, or some of the technology that we already have uh, in the army. Okay, and people will be able to come down here and check out all the different, then these are future things. These are things we're working on. They're going to be able to come down to the innovation the innovation corner. Uh, I just very quickly, when soldiers, and there'll be some young soldiers, I'm sure, that will come through here. When they see this stuff, how do they react? How do, when they see what's a down, the, down the line for them, how do they react? So I, I, I think soldiers get real, really excited about it. Uh, or soldiers will be very, very straightforward to you, and they'll tell you if something is a bad idea. Uh, is that so, is that is that something you, you need to hear? Oh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. We we need to hear uh, from a soldier uh, because a lot of the ways in which our scientists and engineers develop things, they may not have taken in, into account or taken into full account how a soldier who's had battlefield experience yeah. might use a piece of equipment. Okay. Any more questions, Max? No more questions. Think, a lot of a lot of people checking that. in. <laughs> no, a lot of people checking in. A lot of people saying thank you for your service, but not many questions okay. this morning. Well, you, I, you, that's because you're such a good question answer. Yeah. Uh, thank now, you. will you be when when you come to this event to ASA AUSA Global Symposium? What is it you want to see? I mean, you're you're coming at it from a different direction than than than, than, yeah. than I would. But what do you want to see? So, so what I'd like to see uh, as the commander of uh, RDECOM, what I'd like to see is how are the partnerships occurring between industry and the Army in the development of various different technologies. Oftentimes, uh, I will meet with specific industry partners and I'll ask them, I'll say, how much of the technology that you're showing me today came about through collaboration with Army researchers yeah. and scientists because that's what's what's interesting to me because a lot of this stuff uh, you'll see some of it uh, has been done uh, largely by our research and scientists yeah. depending on whether or not there is a niche uh, that might have a commercial application but a lot of it is is what we are focused on and what we're focused on is developing technology that provides capability that enables the warfighter to go out and work. The Global Sym Force Symposium allows industry to see what, what's there sure. and what you want. I'm sure there's a great Absolutely. there's a great deal of conversation about this is what we would like from you people. Right. Or like you guys to work on. Would the army be as successful if we didn't have events like this? I mean it seems to me that you have to do this to bring everybody together. Yeah, I, th I think uh, I think this goes a long way uh, to sharing that understanding between what the Army is thinking about and what industry can provide 
uh, because it also gives industry an opportunity to talk to us and say, hey, you know, you guys may not have been thinking about this particular type of uh, technology or this particular type of capability, uh, and we've got some things that we can show you uh, and then we would like you to kind of put it in your crucible, run it through the paces, and see how it works. So that's that. We we don't dominate uh, the technology space in in every area, and so it's it is very important to have that crosstalk going on. I got to believe that excites you when somebody brings up something that you might not have thought about. It, it does. It does a lot, and okay. uh, I want to get it out and uh, into the hands of soldiers as quickly as possible. And is there let a, them is there a us. timeline go? I mean, for things, do you, do you think, Steve, I'd like to have this out in a couple of years. And sure. I realize there's, you've got to design it, you've got to test it, sure. you've got to really test it to make sure it works in a field environment. But right. what's the goal from start to finish on these, on these high-tech projects? Yeah, so I think it varies. Um, some of our bigger systems that have a lot of technology in it, say, for example, an aviation system, uh, it takes a number of years. Yeah. I would say nothing short of about eight years. Yeah. Uh, to bring about the technology. The other thing is you're tied to a couple of factors. So you're t certainly tied to the money, right? How much money you can invest in the development. Uh, you're also uh, tied to the technology itself. Certain technologies mature a lot faster than other technologies. Uh, and then you're tied to time. The amount of time in which the Army has determined uh, it will need this technology tied to bringing about those things where how much we can afford, how much technology we can we can introduce at one time. So, eight years for a very very uh, mature technology. Some of the the smaller items, <clears throat> we certainly would like to see that out in two to five years if it's possible. Uh, and that's only because of some of the limitations that we have uh, with our processes. I got to believe there is one little frustration built into that. Something you start working on today that's really out there and you, and you hope to have it deployed and operational in five years, somewhere during that timeline somebody comes up with something that either makes it something better or they figured out there's a countermeasure before you get it filled. Sure. Does, sure. does, does that happen on a regular basis? It, it, it happens on a regular base, yeah. basis now uh, because of the rapid yeah. uh, change in technology and as I mentioned our potential adversaries, uh, they can go and find technology yeah. uh, that is readily available out in the open market, uh, and some of that stuff is very, very yeah. inexpensive uh, to buy. And so what we have to do is we have to introduce technology uh, that is not the m most expensive, yeah. uh, the million dollar, two million dollar uh, types of technology to counter uh, yeah. a $10,000 piece of equipment, we have to introduce technology that is uh, low cost and effective on low, the battlefield. Low cost, effective, simple to use, Correct. and out there as quick as you can get it out Absolutely. there. Absolutely. All right, sir. Thank, thank you for being with us. No problem. Uh, it's obvious you know your stuff. Good to be here. Good to be here. I tell you what, come down to the Innovation Corner and you'll see the semi-autonomous uh, equipment, but there are other things here. They haven't set it all up yet, but they will. And once the thing opens, remember, bring an ID. Uh, you can look at the exhibits. You don't have to be an AUSA member, but they would really like you to join. And then you can help make this stuff happen. Absolutely. Looking forward to seeing folks. Thank you.